One of the questions we receive from time to time is, how do I pray? Do I just start by telling God all of my needs? Do I just praise God? How do I actually structure my prayer? And so I'd like to give you five points on how to structure your prayer each morning. The first thing to do is ask for forgiveness. Seek God's forgiveness before you begin to pray. And this point is drawn from Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20, which says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. No matter how good of a Christian you think you are, no matter how many charitable deeds you do, the Bible is clear. No one under the sun always does good and never sins. And unfortunately, as humans, we often sin knowingly. However, there are occasions where we sin unknowingly. We sin without even realizing it. And so it's always good to begin your prayer by seeking forgiveness from the Lord for the sins you know you've committed and those that might not have registered in your mind. So begin praying by asking for forgiveness and confessing your sins. Secondly, give thanks. And I cannot stress this point enough. Have an attitude of gratitude. Count your blessings, no matter how small they may seem. And here's an example. Let's say you've just woken up and you're about to pray. You begin by seeking forgiveness And now you're at the second point and you're thinking, okay, what do I thank God for? Well, you had a good night's sleep. You're rested. Someone else in this world had a bed. They had duvet, a pillow, the same as you. But they had no peace. They couldn't rest. They couldn't sleep well. But you could. That's a reason to be grateful. And then... Consider that you went to sleep because you wanted to go to bed at that time or because you were tired. But someone else had to take something in order to fall asleep, despite how hard they tried. That is a reason to be thankful. I haven't even mentioned the fact that God woke you up this morning when many people around the world went to sleep, set an alarm, but never woke up. You have so many reasons to give thanks. So, after confessing your sins, be obedient to Ephesians 5, verse 20, which says, Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the third point is really one of my favorite areas concerning prayer. And this is all to do with praise. I'd like to encourage you to praise God before you take your prayers any further. Bless his holy name. Tell him how good he is to you, how faithful he is, how great and mighty he is. Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hebrews 13 verse 15 says, Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. I personally believe that praise gives our prayers a sweet aroma when we pray from a place of sincerity and having repented of our sins. So praise God. And let him know that he is the only one who has priority over your affection, your attention, and in your mind. The fourth point is to pray for protection. When you wake up, you have no idea what the day has in store. Many people wake up not knowing that their life will change forever on that day. Many people will wake up unaware that the devil has been plotting and scheming our downfall and our destruction. So I always make it a point to pray for protection. 
speak the mighty and powerful blood of Jesus Christ to cover you. Pray that the Lord would go before you and destroy every trap that is set in your way. Ephesians 6 verses 12 to 13 say, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Pray for God's protection, saints. You don't know what type of attack you might face as you're driving on the way to work. You don't know the threat of the enemy that day. There are actually so many unknowns to each day, regardless of how meticulous your planning might be. So ask the Lord to be with you, to keep you, and to guard you. Now, finally, the fifth point is where you lay out your needs. And of course, we all have needs. Those needs vary from season to season. In one season, those needs could be to do with a family member, a spouse, a child. It could be anything. One of my consistent prayer requests is, Lord, bless the work of my hands. And this is a universal prayer that we can all pray. We all work in one form or another. We have jobs, careers, businesses, ideas to execute. So we can all pray that the Lord would bless the work of our hands. Deuteronomy 28 verse 12 says, The Lord will open to you his good treasury to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations but you shall not borrow. Not only is this a wonderful promise, but it's also a prayer request that's very relevant to each of us. We cannot succeed in anything without God's blessing and his favor. So to summarize, when it comes to structuring your prayer, begin with repentance. Ask the Lord for his forgiveness. And then, give Him thanks. Thank Him for the gift of life. Thank Him for health. Thank Him for having a sound mind. Just simply have an attitude of gratitude. And then, you move to giving Him praise. Praise His holy name. Praise Him for being good. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's what the Bible says. And then the fourth point to pray for is divine protection. The devil is out there in the world, like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And so we sure need the protection of Jesus Christ. And finally, remember your own personal prayer requests. Pray for your family. Pray for a breakthrough. Pray for God to bless the work of your hands. Whatever it is, Take it to the Lord. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 21, verses 21 to 22, And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. I have heard many Christians complain over the years that they have not been able to hear from God. I wonder, however, if the problem is not God's lack of speaking, but our lack of ability to listen. We are surrounded by more noise, screens, and distractions today than ever before. Consequently, many of us are uncomfortable with silence. But what if in our silence, God can communicate to us? The first line of Psalm 46 verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. And if you look at the word still here, it means have a deep silence, a deep quietness about you. 
Stop with the vain repetitions in your prayers. Hold off with the list of prayer requests by simply being still. Be quiet and recognize who it is you have bowed down to. Now, how many of us actually practice this? How many of us go and lock ourselves in a room? And instead of praying, God, give me this and that, we simply bow down and be still. As a matter of fact, I would venture to guess that many of us don't really practice being still before God as often as we should. The modern-day Christian man or woman would find it a bit of a struggle to consistently practice being still before the Lord. But this shouldn't be the case because the Bible clearly tells us to be still. The combination of prayer and fasting is also another area that I would think many believers struggle with today. Mark 9 verse 29 says, So he said to them, This kind can come out of nothing but prayer and fasting. The disciples were unable to cast the spirit out. When Jesus arrived, they asked him, why were they not able to cast the spirit out? Jesus responded by highlighting the combination of prayer and fasting. It's a powerful combination that many saints throughout the ages have found to hold great significance in their lives. When was the last time you practiced prayer and fasting in your own life? You will find that when you pray and fast, you are able to direct your thoughts and your attention to the Lord more effectively. And when it comes to fasting, it's much more than just abstaining from food. It is not a diet. It is not primarily about better health, although all those things can be side benefits. Fasting is not a means of manipulating God. Our fasting does not change God's mind. It does not coerce Him to change His plans. Rather, fasting helps to clear our minds and bodies so that we are more receptive to the will of God. Fasting is a very embodied discipline that reminds us that even our most basic needs and desires are not all important. Our appetites do not have the last word. We submit ourselves to the discipline of fasting in order to feed our spirits over our bodies. This is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Through fasting, we train our spirits to say no to the flesh, to say no to our wants and desires. Through fasting, we strengthen our spirits' resilience to ensure that our fleshy desires do not master us. Fasting reminds us who is in charge. And through this practice, joint with prayer, then you'll find your mind and heart transformed by the indwelling power and presence of the Holy Spirit. The combination of prayer and fasting are powerful means of bringing us into the presence of God. They are disciplines that help us to connect with God and be brought into the stream of His will. Prayer and fasting help to silence our minds. It helps to silence our appetites so that we can open ourselves up to hear the still small voice of God or to be still and know that He is God. So the question has never been, is God speaking? The question should be, are you listening? Are you taking the time to be still? I believe that the Lord does still speak to his people even in this day and age. The problem is that many times we are not listening. Prayer and fasting position us to hear the voice of God and to see his hand moving in our lives. So I encourage you to use the spiritual tools and resources available to you. Begin to practice the combination of praying and fasting in your life. Begin to practice being still before the Lord. When you combine prayer and fasting, you're not doing it to gain bonus points from the Lord. Prayer and fasting benefits you. It's for the benefits of your soul. It's for the benefit of your spirit. It aids you to turn the focus away from the world and firmly to the Lord. Fasting and prayer helps to understand God's vision and perspective. It helps us set aside anything that hinders our spiritual growth. So I encourage you to have faith that your relationship with Jesus Christ will grow and flourish as you begin to rid yourself of all worldly desires, as you prioritize feeding the Spirit instead of the flesh. The Bible says in James 5 verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. The Amplified Translation gives us a deeper description as it says, Therefore, 
confess your sins to one another, your false steps, your offenses, and pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man or believer can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and it can have tremendous power. Allow me to highlight a few words that jump out to me concerning prayer and myself as a believer. Firstly, my prayers ought to be heartfelt. They need to come from a deep place within me that longs for the Lord. Secondly, my prayers need to be persistent. They should be frequent. Not just a prayer here and a prayer there, but there has to be a level of consistency about my prayer life. And finally, I need to be practicing righteousness. I need Jesus Christ to help me become a righteous person, a righteous believer. So from James 5 verse 16, I want you to take away three things concerning your prayer life. Your prayers should be heartfelt. Your prayers should be persistent. And you need to be striving to chase and pursue the righteousness of God. Now, I'd like to encourage you from the book of Nehemiah. In chapter 8, the latter part of verse 10 says, Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. We can stand strong because of the great joy we have in Christ. We can be at peace knowing that no matter the outcome of our situation, we have eternal hope in Jesus. We have great assurance that even when things seem uncertain, the Lord is always working out for our best interests. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. All throughout the Bible, we see these beautiful promises. Promises that God will give us strength in our time of need. Promises that our heartfelt and persistent prayers will be heard by God. Promises that we should not sorrow because through the joy of the Lord, we have strength. Over and over, we are reminded that no matter what we face, there is hope. We are heard by the Lord. We should not rely on ourselves for strength, but instead, we should understand that our strength comes from Jesus. So it's not about how hard we try or our ability to fight. It's all about Jesus. Have you ever told someone that you'd meet them somewhere, but somehow the two of you weren't clear about an exact time or an exact spot? Frustrating, right? Especially if you're somewhere and your phone doesn't have a signal or one of your phones has died. Think of how anxious you might be, wondering if they're at the right place, but on the opposite side, or are they even there at all? Maybe you two got confused or somehow misunderstood one another. Exactly what should you do? Should you stay there or just leave? Who knows if they're even going to show up? You actually have other things you could be doing with your time, right? Maybe you're short on time and short on patience. Just how long should you sit there? Now, let's put a name to this unknown person. What if the missing individual in this scenario is God? 
Are you willing to wait? Do you devise another plan? Or do you just forget about it? Because obviously, if this thing were going to come to pass, it would have by now, right? Or would it? What if he's actually in the right place and he's waiting on you to arrive? Or what if you are in the right place, but the timing is off? Can you wait for him? Huh? Can you be still? Can you wait patiently? Can you trust him to show up? Can you trust that his promise will manifest? Do you believe that if you manage to wait, it'll be worth every moment? Well, I do. And I believe that if you look back over your life, you'll see that every time a promise manifested, though the wait wasn't easy, it was well worth it. As Mark 7.37 says, He does all things well. You know, one of the things I love about the Lord is that He loves to go to the places where He can find those who have been rejected, those who've been hurt and abandoned. He loves to go to places that nobody puts high on the map. In fact, He's a God who makes it His business to go and find Himself in situations where are those who have been forgotten, denied, shunned away, and pushed to the side. And have you ever noticed that we all have a tendency to attract people who are in the same boat as us? People with the same kind of drama you're facing, the same kind of problems you're going through in your life. And I wonder how many people are listening right now who because of whatever drama they face in their lives don't feel connected. They don't feel plugged in and find themselves standing afar off. People who are smiling on the outside, but crying on the inside. People who are going to church, but aren't really plugged in. And you may be one of those people today. You may have found yourself emotionally void. You may be there feeling rejected and afar off. But I have news for you today. God loves to connect with the people who others consider to be outcast. Fix your eyes on him, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Your cry should only be to him. He's the one that can transform your life. And it doesn't matter where you are or what you're situated in. If you cry out to God in the midst of your dilemma, he will bring deliverance. If you cry out to God right in the middle of your situation, he will bring freedom. Don't be the type of Christian who just wants Jesus to save them from a problem. And after that, he becomes secondary. We let our anger call the shots. We let our bodies control us. We let our friends in high places call the shots. But we need to get to a place where the word of God calls the shots for our lives. We need to be crying out to God. We need to be crying out for his hand to touch our lives. We need to be crying out for his love, grace, and tender mercy. And the thing about mercy is, you need to thank God for mercy. The Bible says the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, meaning that these aren't recycled mercies. These are brand new mercies every day. Some of us think that God needs to do something spectacular for you to praise him. But just the fact that he allowed me to wake up this morning with life running through my veins, that's mercy. He's a God who will see you no matter where you are. Spending time with God helps to strengthen our faith. Don't make the mistake of thinking that God is the one who benefits from us taking the time to get to know him. That's not the case. Spending time with God doesn't help God as much as it helps us. God already knows us. He knows our secrets and the depths of our thoughts and motivations. He knows what we try and hide in the cover of darkness. He knows all and sees all. 
It's us that need to know him. We're the ones that are called in the book of Malachi, where the Lord says, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store. How do you expect to grow closer to God if we don't spend time with Him? How do we expect to develop an intimate relationship if we neglect quality time? There are several things that spending time with God does for us. Spending time in prayer or in worship, spending time being still and knowing that He is God, spending time meditating on His Word and reading Scripture puts us in a position to be able to commune with God and get to know Him on a personal level. What does He love? What does He hate? What makes Him happy? What makes Him sad? What are the most important things to Him? What does He value? What does He want from me? These are the things that we learn from spending quality time with the Lord. We learn who He is. We learn what he expects from us as his children. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That means that if you are feeling crushed with disappointment, then you trust in the Lord with all your heart. If you thought this was the person God intended for you to marry, but they walked away from you, then continue to lean not on your own understanding, but to trust in the Lord with all your heart. If you prepared, you studied, you met all the criteria required for that job, for that position, but they rejected you? Well, child of God, lean not on your own understanding. God will direct your paths. This is what all believers are called to do. So, no matter what comes, keep believing in Jesus Christ. No matter what comes, remain anchored in the one who rose from the dead. No matter what comes, do not, I repeat, do not give up. Hold on to Jesus because when you are weak, He is strong. So use his strength. Use his might. I want to speak to someone who needs hope. Or maybe you're there in a season where you have more prayer requests than you have faith. Well, to you, hold on a little longer. Don't give up just yet. The Lord sees you. You see, God intervenes in his time, not ours. God knows the future and has everything planned out. The problem for us is that we want to know everything. Why didn't this happen? What caused that to happen? When will this come through? How do I make this work? But may I remind you that Jeremiah 29:11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you a hope and a future. And oh, how sometimes we all wish he would share his plans with us. But let me encourage you to trust God. He knows the obstacles that will slow you from achieving the good he has in store for you. He knows the decisions of others that will cause you pain. He knows the decisions you will make that will lead you down the wrong path. He knows the peaks and valleys which lie in your path and that the ultimate destination He is guiding you to will be one of glory.